day, everyone. Welcome back to Oral Communication in Context. For our fifth lesson, we will be discussing intercultural communication. For today's lesson, we will be discussing all of these things. First one is the definition of culture. We're also going to be defining what intercultural communication is. Similarly, we will also be discussing the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity or DMIS. We'll also be discussing some barriers to intercultural communication. What are the characteristics of a competent intercultural communicator? And of course, provide ways on how we could improve our intercultural communication skills. These are just some of the many ways we greet people. No matter where you are in the world or what language you speak, communication is important. It is also affected by many of our differences, including our very own culture. So how are we going to define culture? Culture is simply described or it's a word that is used to refer to all of the characteristics that are common to a particular group of people. Now, these characteristics are learned. They are something that is acquired and it's not given by nature. So basically, when you are born, you are not born with a specific culture already. The way that your parents reared you or the way the society that you grew up in functions, that is basically what's going to constitute or influence or affect the culture that you're going to have as you grow up. Culture is also defined as a social system. It is comprised of values, our beliefs, our attitudes, the norms that we have, for example, the traditions that you have, things that you are used to doing or things that you are used to using. And then, of course, you have your ways of behaving. How do you typically behave in a particular situation or in a particular event, for example? Aside from that, these are some of the things that you have to remember about culture. First and foremost, it is a human creation. Like what I have mentioned earlier, it is not something that you are born with. Your culture will depend on how you are raised or how you were reared by your parents, how your society brought you up, okay? So all of those things might influence the culture that you're going to be having as you grow up. Another thing that you have to remember about culture is that it is described as the human part of the environment. So what does it mean when we refer to the human part of the environment? It only means that culture is something that is very specific. It's particular to us human beings. Take for example, animals do not have a specific culture. Culture. But for us human beings, we have different sets of culture. It is also described as a non-biological aspect of life, meaning, okay, it is not part, is it is not a physical part of your body. That's what makes it non-biological. As mentioned earlier as well, it is something that is learned from parents, schools, the media, and even your broader community. Culture is an expression of our modes of living and thinking. It is reflected and can be seen in our literature, religious practices, and even in recreation and enjoyment. It is something that varies not just from country to country, but could also differ from one place to another. To better understand one's culture, you have to look into their history, ethnicity, religion, ecology, technology, as well as their educational and social backgrounds. So now, how are we going to define intercultural communication? Intercultural communication is simply described as our ability to communicate, interact, and work with people of varying nationalities, backgrounds, cultures, and even languages across the world. So basically, we use intercultural communication when we communicate with or among people who are different from us in terms of our cultural aspects. Tane Toomey in 1999 suggests that intercultural communication happens when an individual interacts, negotiate, and create meanings while bringing in their varied cultural background. So while you are talking to someone who is different from you in terms of culture, okay, 
while you are talking, while you are interacting with that person, the way that you communicate is influenced, of course, by the culture that you have. That's what makes intercultural communication fascinating and, of course, tricky at times as well because you will bring in what you know, what you believe in to that particular communicative situation. However, the other person that you are talking with might not be sharing the same cultural background as you are. That is basically what intercultural communication is all about. Even if that is the case, intercultural communication can actually flow very smoothly and become very interesting for cross-cultural groups. But like what I have said earlier, it may not go as planned, especially when cultural collisions occur. So we define cultural collisions as cultural differences that we or the communicators cannot compromise with. Cultural collisions may occur when, of course, there's a difference in belief, there's a difference in attitudes towards the discussion or towards the topic of conversation. It can also occur when you interpret things differently, which is, of course, your interpretation is affected by the cultural background that you have. One example of cultural differences is our varying forms of greeting. In East Asian countries, people bow their heads as a way to say hello. In Western countries, however, it is typical to shake hands, hug, and even kiss cheeks of the people they are meeting. Another good example is our dining etiquettes. East Asian countries typically use chopsticks, whereas Americans would be using spoon and fork. More often than not, whenever you engage in intercultural communication, your speech is continuously accompanied by gestures, facial expressions, and other body movements that may add to whatever you are saying and effectively deliver your message across. However, it is very important that we understand that many communication patterns exist in other cultures as well. As I have mentioned earlier, cultural collisions often occur because of our cultural differences, the differences between and among cultures. However, there was this communication specialist who tried to explore how we actually get over those cultural differences in order for us to communicate effectively, all right? So his name is Dr. Milton Bennett, and he was the one who developed the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, also known as DMIS. So according to Dr. Bennett, people actually experience cultural differences in different ways. So, the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity was established in order to fully understand how we interpret, how we make sense of these cultural differences, okay? In the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, there are several stages. The first stage is what he referred to as denial. For example, if a person believes that his or her culture is the only real culture, then he is still on this first stage in intercultural sensitivity, which is denial. He's still denying that there are other cultures out there. There are cultures that are different from who he is or what what he is. In the denial stage, the individual fails to see any cultural differences or any cultural difference and tends, of course, to ignore and isolate themselves from other groups. Since they are in denial of the existence of other cultures, they would just keep to themselves. So take for example, a person who is still on this, on the first stage of DMIS or denial, they would often say that they never experienced culture shock because they believe that it's only their culture that is existing. Okay? And as long as they speak the same language, then there's no problem. There's no real difference in the cultures that they have. On the second stage, we call it defense. 
So in this stage, it feels as though their own culture is the only good culture, okay? So once a person has already gone past the denial stage, they now go to the defensive stage. They acknowledge the fact that there are other cultures. However, they still feel threatened about those cultures because they believe that their culture is superior. It's the only good culture and it's the culture that other people should should have. So these people who are in the defensive stage or on the stage, a second stage of DMIS, they tend to be more critical. So they try to make criticisms about or regarding different cultures and tends to have a narrow focus on what is really appropriate and what is correct. Since they could only acknowledge um, the background that they have, the cultural background that they have, it's boxed onto that belief system as well. That's why they have a very narrow focus of what's appropriate and what's correct. Remember that there are some things that are acceptable in one culture but not acceptable in another culture. So if you only believe in the culture that you have and you think that everything your culture has taught you is correct, then your focus on or your idea of what is right, what is wrong, what is appropriate, and what is not will also be very narrow, very simple minded. People in this stage usually, the best example of this one is when people say that they wish that other people would just talk the way that they do. Okay? So they acknowledge that other languages exist. Other ways of communicating exist. However, they are still believing that the way that they communicate personally based on their own cultural upbringing, that's the only thing that is correct. The third stage is what we refer to as minimization or simply put, you are trying to minimize. Now, what are we minimizing? In this stage, you are beginning to find commonalities between your own culture and people of other culture. So you are trying now to connect with them by looking at the things that you are sharing or the things that you have the same. The idea of minimization or the third stage of DMIS, it's banking on the universality of ideas. That there are certain concepts, certain ideas here in our planet, in our society, that is universal. Meaning, it doesn't change even if you have different cultures. Okay? So, take for example, the concept of love, the concept of hope, the concept of peace. Alright? So, um, we try to bank on those abstract ideas. Okay, in this stage, the people who are experiencing minimization is now starting to recognize that all people are people despite differences. No one is above the other. We are all the same because we share commonalities. There are similarities between and among us. So people in this stage would often say that it's a small world after all. Okay, we are connected one way or another. Now, the fourth stage is what we refer to as acceptance. It's quite easy. It simply promotes the belief that one's culture is just one of the many cultures in the world. So right now, if you are already on this stage, you are accepting of the idea that you are different. You focus now on the difference, but it's something that is good. Being different from them is good. Having Many different cultures is something that is good, something that is acceptable, okay? Now, because you are accepting of those concepts, of those cultures, of the existence of other cultures, your curiosity and the desire to learn is starting to develop. So you become more curious and you want to explore, you want to learn more about other people's culture because you know that it will help you one way or another. And because of that, because you are starting to become curious, you start to become interested, you also get to appreciate certain cultural differences, especially in behaviors and eventually in values or beliefs or our ways of thinking as well. So in this stage, people would often say that the more different we are, it's the better. If in minimization, you are only focusing on the similarities, 
when you are already in the fourth stage of BMIS, you are focusing now on the differences, but in a good way because you get, you accept more of these differences. You accept that there are differences and that is okay. The more different we are, the better it is for everyone. The next stage in the DMIS is what we refer to as adaptation. It is simply our ability of becoming more competent in how we communicate with people of other cultures. So now that you are accepting of the differences of the differences that you have among and between each other, you also become more competent in communicating with them because you are already considering those differences whenever you try to communicate or interact with them. And because of that, your mind becomes more open to varying worldviews. Remember that different people in the world have different opinions of different matters. So you are now more open to those worldviews and you become more accepting of new perspectives. You don't just, you don't think that their perspectives, their viewpoints are incorrect. You become more accepting of it and you try to connect it with their cultural background as well. You try to ask yourself, why is it that they are thinking that way? Probably it's because of how they were raised or how their society functions and so on and so forth. Now, in adaptation as well, it is important that you are trying to put your self in the shoes or in the position of others so you become more understanding of their situation of their cultural background in short you are learning to see the world through another's eyes people in this stage would often say that they have to change their approach to adapt to differences and behave in culturally appropriate ways. So when we say adaptation as well, we simply refer to our ability to be flexible in communicating with people of different cultures. So you try to figure out because you want to improve on it. You want to communicate with them, improve the communication process, improve the interaction with them. Okay, so you try to find ways on how you could do that. Next up, we have integration. Integration is the sixth stage in the DMIS. So the people who are already on the stage, they start to go beyond their own cultures. And they see themselves based on different cultural viewpoints. Okay, so this is where the question of what if I am a member of this cultural group. That is where this pops up. And because of that, you are thinking like that. You are able to understand different cultures and promote unity among them because you are now understanding it on their own perspective using their own mindset. Now, when people do that, if a lot of people actually are in the integration stage, it's not going to be difficult for them to interact and maintain a relationship with someone who is of a different culture or even with another group who is of a different culture. Therefore, there is unity. Unity is starting because the stronger the bond, the better united we become. So some people in this stage would probably say that everywhere is home if you learn and understand their culture. It doesn't matter wherever you are in the world. But if you know how to adapt, how to integrate yourself in that area, in that place, then you would be able to live just fine. Just like any other forms of communication, there are factors that may affect any intercultural communicative situation. Situation. Here are some of the barriers to intercultural communication. The first barrier to intercultural communication is ethnocentrism. It is simply the belief that your own cultural group's behaviors, norms, ways of thinking, and ways of being are superior to all other cultural groups, meaning you believe that you are superior above anyone else. So if you are thinking like that, then you are probably ethnocentric, okay? So you only believe that your own culture is the only culture that there should be, and it's above anything else. All of the other cultures are below us, okay? So take, for example, what happened during the Nazi regime. 
regime. Okay, so during this time, um, there was a notion that was perpetuated by the Nazis that Jews are the lesser culture. They are the lesser beings. Okay, so Hitler wanted to form a pure Aryan race. So during the Holocaust, he tried to, of course, eliminate all of those he believed are inferior to their own culture. Another barrier that we often encounter in intercultural communication is stereotyping or creating stereotypes, producing stereotypes. Now, stereotyping is simply defined as oversimplification. You are trying to simplify it overly. The characteristics of one person, you are trying to oversimplify it. So it could also be a distortion of views of another race, another ethnic group, or even another culture. Now, stereotyping is very common, especially in the society that we are living in right now. This is how we make assumptions so quickly about other people without even trying to get to know them better. So you are trying to make assumptions based on what you can just see, based on what you have heard about them, or based on what you are believing in about them. So take, for example, a very, a very common stereotype is about people who are wearing glasses. When you see a person wearing glasses, more often than not, your assumption of them is that they are smart. Either they are smart, they are nerds, or they are people who are very studious. Okay? So take for example like that. But it could not... It, will not always be like their eyesights are bad. It's always an assumption about who they are as a person and how they are as a person. Now, because of those things, because of ethnocentrism and stereotyping, there are also other things that might result from those two barriers. So take, for example, we have prejudice. When we say prejudice, because of your preconceptions or your notions about another person, you start to develop negative attitude towards them, specifically towards a cultural group based on little or no experience without even having to interact with them. You are already developing a negative attitude towards them, all because of what you have heard from other people or how they were even portrayed in the society. Okay, another thing is discrimination. Now, how is discrimination different from prejudice? Prejudice is just a negative attitude meaning you are still not acting upon that negative attitude. You are probably just keeping it to yourself. However, if you are already starting to take action and those actions are already trying to exclude, avoid, or distance yourself from that other group, that is already discrimination. Okay, so you are you are stepping it up. Your prejudice, you are stepping it up taking it up another notch because you are trying sometimes you are trying to take away some of the things that they could have enjoyed as well okay however since you are discriminating against them they don't have they couldn't do the same thing that you are doing so take for example um, in prejudice, when we see people who have tattoos, usually we try to back off. We try to distance ourselves to, from them because we believe that they are bad people, alright? Now, when a tattooed person doesn't get a job, for example, all because of that prejudice, if they don't get a job, or sometimes they are denied to do certain things, all because they are tattooed, because of that prejudice, because of that negative attitude towards them, then that is already discrimination because you are taking away something from them already, which they have every right to do anyway. Throughout your life, you will be interacting and communicating with people from different cultures or different backgrounds. So it is important for us to develop as well our intercultural competence, okay? Our communication skills when we communicate or interact with people of different cultural backgrounds. In order for us to be competent in intercultural communication, the first thing that is highlighted is our ability to be flexible, our ability to adapt to certain situations. And it is also important that we have the ability to tolerate high levels of uncertainty. 
remember that when you talk to someone of a different cultural background, it is not always the case that you know them completely. Okay, so there are certain things that you might not know about them, you might not know about their culture. Therefore, it presents possibilities that there will be things that you might disagree with. Okay, there are things that may be different from what you believe in. That is the reason why when you come in a cultural or an intercultural communicative situation, you need to prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for the worst and prepare yourself for the better. It is also important for us to develop reflectiveness or mindfulness, being considerate, thinking, mulling about the things that we have just heard, okay, and not taking it negatively right away. So we have to be careful with how we interpret messages from our intercultural communicators. Similarly, of course, you have to be open-minded. You have to be accepting of differences. You have to be careful with what you say because who knows if it might offend the person that you are talking with, especially if it's not something that is acceptable um, on their culture. So you have to be sensitive with that and learn to adapt, be flexible, turn the wheel around, okay, when you communicate with them just so it will flow smoothly the interaction will flow smoothly other factors that may affect the way that we communicate interculturally is our gender so take for example men would communicate differently from women same with the members of the lgbt community so you have to be careful or mindful rather of these things another thing to consider is the age there are certain cultures wherein age is a very big consideration it's a very important thing to consider whenever you engage with them or communicate with them so take for example cultures such as east asian cultures like the chinese the japanese and the Korean, they are very particular with age. They believe that if someone is older than you, then the first time that you encounter them, or unless they have given you permission to, you have to talk to them with respect. You have to use respectful formal language. However, there are certain cultures, take for example, like Western cultures, it's okay for you to talk casually to people who are older than you, especially if they are not related to you somehow. So there are certain differences that you have to consider when we are referring to age. Another thing, another important thing to consider in intercultural communication is the social status. There are certain cultures that are also particular with this one and there are cultures that this is very irrelevant. This is something that you don't really have to consider or think about too much. And of course, part of our culture is differences in religion. Different religions also have different ways on communicating because religion is often comprised of our beliefs, okay? And our attitudes, our values are sometimes, or more often than not, anchored to our beliefs, our belief system or our religion. So you have to be considerate of these factors as well. Again, Gender, age, social status, and religion are some of the factors that you have to consider when you are communicating interculturally or engaging in intercultural communication. Here are my sources and references for this lesson. Thank you for joining me.